I went to the last US dietary guidelines because the US dietary guidelines kind of spill over into all of our countries, yours, mine, Australia, New Zealand. And I looked at the evidence that they looked through to try to come up with, with their uh, guidelines. Um, and they split it into different categories. So they'd look at, in fact, they didn't even look at red meat. They looked at animal proteins. They'd look at animal protein and heart disease, animal protein and different types of cancers, animal protein and diabetes. So I just went through their systematic review systematically. And in every single circumstance, they either hadn't studied red meat or they had found nothing. And these were association studies anyway, so these were not randomised controlled trials. Don't go and eat everyone else's fat, particularly if you've got a weight problem. Don't go stupid, but eat the fat that naturally comes with your food. So if you've got a marbled ribeye or whatever, eat the fat that naturally comes with your ribeye. Welcome to the Born Unstoppable podcast. I'm Thiago Lusvargi, a family medicine resident in Ontario, Canada. And in this episode, my guest is Zoe Harkom. Dr. Zoe Harkum is a researcher, author, blogger, and public speaker in the field of diet and health with a PhD in public health nutrition. Her particular areas of interest and expertise are public health dietary guidelines, especially dietary fat, nutrition, and obesity. Zoe used to be a vegetarian for 20 years before reviewing research that convinced her to switch to a more animal-based diet. In this episode, we cover how to approach nutrition in a systematic and practical way, which leads you to increasing animal proteins. We discuss the importance of understanding the difference between cholesterol and lipoproteins, why environmental CO2 might not be the issue it is portrayed to be, why fiber is not an essential uh, amino acid or is not essential in our diet, and more. Before we begin, I'd like to emphasize that this podcast is separate from my role as a family medicine resident at the University of Toronto at the Royal Victoria Hospital in Barrie, and I may cover topics that aren't fully aligned with the CPSO, our governing body of physicians here in Ontario. It is, however, part of my desire to bring awareness and information as it relates to improving health and other aspects of life at a zero cost to the general public. Hey, Zoe. Nice to meet you. It's nice to finally be able to sit down and have a conversation with you. I've been looking forward to it for uh, quite some time. Oh, thank you. That's very nice to say. Thank you for the invite. It was a really nice surprise to receive that. I've heard lots of good things. I uh, The way I came across your content um, is I shadowed a doctor who has a medical nutrition practice focused on weight loss and reversing type 2 diabetes. And we were just kind of bonding over all the scientific things that we disagree with in the current space and what we agree with. And he brought up your website because you tackle a lot of the uh, articles and break it down in a way that we understand the statistics. And I got a chance to to see some of your blogs and watch a couple of your videos. And I really appreciate how um, you keep the information simple, straightforward, and easy to digest. Thank you. Um, why don't we start off with you sharing a little bit of who you are and how you kind of got to this this point in your life, why you uh, talk about diet and your research, and then we'll dive into a, a couple of questions. Okay. Um, right, potted history. First interest in anything to do with food was when I was a teenager and my brother was a teenager and he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And that had a huge impact on the family because we were suddenly helping him inject so he didn't have the same injection site. The family diet changed. Um, the advice then wasn't too bad. It certainly wasn't the kind of plates and pyramids that we have nowadays. It was much more um, you're going to need to eat whole foods. And uh, we came from a background of sort of high teas, which was sandwiches, cakes, um, scones sort of in the afternoon after quite a big lunch which was kind of um, you know the Welsh way the northern England way all of that had to change um, wind forward I then ended up at Cambridge University and uh, just became fascinated by the fact that there were a number of people around me with eating problems it was sort of almost the birth of the eating disorder I guess in that period of time 
and realizing that people did not want to be obese and yet obesity was just going up and up and up. Um, I then left Cambridge, started a, a great sort of blue chip career. I ended up working for um, Big Food, Mars. I ended up working for Big Pharma, SmithKline Beecham or GlaxoSmithKline as it is now. So I've kind of seen those industries from the inside. Um, had a really great career in HR. I traveled the world, ended up as sort of um, executive vice, vice president for human resources. And then 2009 got the opportunity to leave the corporate world and pursue my interest and my passion. And I'd kind of had this interest in diet and obesity in parallel with all the, the um, corporate work that I was doing. And I had actually written a book while I was in the corporate world in 2004, and it was called Why Do You Overeat When All You Want Is To Be Slim? And it was clearly trying to answer that question, physical reasons for overeating, uh, emotional, mental reasons for overeating, um, carried on with my uh, corporate career and then another couple of books came out in 2008 and that's when I thought okay I'm going to see if I can make my passion what I do um, and clearly it's not as lucrative as being a executive vice president of human resources but it's it's been really nice really fun and uh, really enjoyed what we've done so that's what I've been doing since and in the last um, gosh how long since 2009 so that's 12 13 years did a PhD in public health during that time um, and then kind of got onto the speaker's circuit, spoke at a lot of conferences uh, and generally have busted quite a few nutrition myths along the way. And then, as you very kindly said, I do this Monday note. I've been doing this Monday note now um, since 2010 where I take an academic article and they now usually come from supporters. I don't have to go looking for them, so I get an email um, every day saying, hey, can you look at this one? So I just keep mixing them up so I don't get bored, the punters don't get bored. And today, for example, there was one saying, does salt cause metabolic syndrome? And of course the answer is no, um, but the paper kind of concluded that it did. So I took it apart, showed what was wrong with the paper, what they hadn't adjusted for. Um, all the other um, cofactors that they hadn't taken into account, and that's kind of what I do. So that's me. Well, I appreciate that. You're putting in a lot of work, and I was kind of reading through your, your website, and you've been in or been involved in about 53 papers since 2013, um, which is quite a bit, which is really, really neat because it to do all that work, to work with people. I think you've worked with Dave Feltman recently on a recent paper, um, you have to go through a lot of the research and that's what I value about interviewing somebody like you that has a PhD because you have, you take the time you're involved, you're in the trenches getting to know the research. Whereas doc, I'm a young doctor, but like doctors like me in my field, we just kind of turn to the guidelines and, uh, trust that everything is, you know, very accurate and, and we don't have too much time to, to get into the papers. And so it's nice that there's that option to be able to read your Monday kind of breakdown of certain articles to get a little bit of more knowledge and understanding of like, okay, what are different things that we should consider um, before taking an article and its results at, at face value? Yeah, if I looked a little bit puzzled then actually, just because it froze, the screen froze at my oh. end, so hopefully that doesn't happen again. Um, hey Dave, I mean, Dave Feldman, we've communicated, he's been over, he's stayed with me, um, he's interviewed me about cholesterol because that's his thing. We haven't actually collaborated on a paper, um, but we kind of will share ideas or help each other. He, he's definitely somebody each of us could go to and say, hey, ha have you done this? Um, but yes, I mean, in the field, um, I've worked with people like Malcolm Kendrick, Ufi Ravenskoff, David Diamond, um, some great, there's an organization called the International Network of Cholesterol Skeptics, and they're a, a very sort of disparate bunch. They will have very heated discussions on what we think does cause heart disease, but the thing that unifies us is we don't think it's cholesterol. Uh, we think mm -hmm. the cholesterol hypothesis is a, is a massive oversimplification and just not very helpful, to be honest, because it just puts people down the um, meds route, avoids saturated fat route. We can come on to how insane that is if, if that's somewhere you want to go. Um, but yeah. it, it's, it's just not that helpful. So, yeah, lots of different collaborations. And then I guess um, most of the papers um, actually came from my PhD. I was probably quite 
fortunate in in that respect that the PhD was in a few parts so there was kind of a paper on this part and another paper on this part and background paper to that part and then a um, wrapping it all together so it was quite a um, prolific PhD shall I say for for papers that came from it which was quite nice and obviously the university is always very happy with that because they get points and points mean money yeah <laughs> so I want to give you kind of a scenario that I often find uh, I see in the clinic. Um, as a new family medicine resident, I'm responsible for a roster of 200 patients. Um, and I see some of my colleagues' patients as well. And so I think having a scenario to kind of frame some of the questions that we kind of will answer throughout the podcast might be helpful even for, for the listeners especially. So this is something that I often come across. I just want you to imagine like if you had someone in front of you that wanted to lose weight, but they're concerned about eating too much meat because they've been told it's carcinogenic, bad for the environment, bad for their heart, and their doctor told them that plant-based diet is better and more sustainable. That is... Unfortunately, I've seen that a little bit too often in the even the small portion of patients that I've seen so far. I'm only four months in and I often find myself trying to comfort people and be like, it's OK to eat red meat. Like some patients will eat it once every six weeks. Um, wow. And when I. Crikey. Yeah. And I was like, it's OK. Break it down to every three weeks, once a week. Like it's not bad for you. And um a couple of times I had a supervisor actually kind of caution me, say, hey, Tiago, um, I appreciate your, you know, em your passion for nutrition, but maybe you have to slow down a little bit on the red meat thing because we know uh, there's studies that show it's bad for the heart and bad for the environment. And I was like, okay, like, and she was very nice. She wasn't confrontational. She didn't want to debate, but just, it's just so I'm aware of the guidelines and just not to be kind of handing out stakes to everybody. So that's kind of like the frame that I approach some of these conversations now, having personal experience talking with patients. Um, kind of bird's eye view to frame so people know where you're coming from. Like in your perspective, from your research, what do you think is an ideal diet for humans? Okay. Um, just before I come on to that, because that's a great question. On the, there's loads of evidence against heart disease and, and all the rest of it. There just isn't. Um, so one of the things we can add to the show notes is if you go on my site and put in red meat, the evidence, I've actually got a post on that where I went to the last US dietary guidelines because the US dietary guidelines kind of spill over into all of our countries, yours, mine, Australia, New Zealand. And I looked at the evidence that they looked through to try to come up with, with their uh, guidelines. Um, and they split it into different categories. So they'd look at, in fact, they didn't even look at red meat. They looked at animal proteins. They'd look at animal protein and heart disease, animal protein and different types of cancers, animal protein and diabetes. So I just went through their systematic review systematically. And in every single circumstance, they either hadn't studied red meat or they had found nothing. And these were association studies anyway. So these were not randomized controlled trials. So I would have mm -hmm. said to your supervisor, um, you know, thank you very much for your input. I would be thrilled to see all the randomized control trial evidence against red meat next time we have a meeting because there is none. She would not be able mm -hmm. to produce any. So um, it, it's just one of these myths that has come about that, oh, um, cows are destroying the environment. Red meat is going to kill you. Red meat causes heart disease, all, all the rest of it. The evidence just isn't there. So back to your question. Where do I go at this from a top level? And I, I say this at conferences. Um, I have three really, really simple principles when it comes to eating. And I find that it's difficult then for people to argue against you because they are very sensible and that they're just impossible to knock down. So number one, eat real food. So I think if you sat down with your female supervisor or colleague or whatever and said, look, can we agree that people should be eating real food? They should not be eating processed food. They should not be eaten in the food hall in the mall and all the rest of it. I'm sure you'd have a major area of agreement. You know, what is real food? It's, it's food that comes from the ground and um, the environment around us. It's not made in a factory. It comes from a farm, not a factory. Great. So you agree on real food. Second principle, choose that real food for the nutrients it provides. So then you ask the question, why do we eat? Yeah, it's enjoyable, it's sociable, but we eat because there are certain nutrients without which we die. You know, let's not pull any punches. 
unless we get retinol, we are going to get eye disease. Unless we get vitamin D, we are going to get rickets or um, viruses, all kinds of disease or whatever. Each nutrient that we need, there's a reason for it. So what are the things mm -hmm. that we need? So you look at the macronutrient level and macronutrients, there are three. We know them as protein, carbohydrate, and fat. fat. And then you look at the micronutrient level. So at the macronutrient level, what must we eat? There are essential proteins, amino acids that we must consume because the body doesn't make them. We must get them in our diet. There are essential fats. Again, they're essential because the body doesn't make them. We must get them in our diet. There are no essential carbohydrates. So immediately, you're heading down the path that is going to be the winning path. Um, and where do you find those essential proteins and those essential fats? Well, the essential proteins are the complete proteins. And the only food that provides complete protein comes from animals. I used to be a vegetarian, so I'm, I'm not coming right. at this because I'm... Sean Baker's, you know, sister or something, and, and I'm pushing the carnivore diet. It, it's just a nutritional fact. Um, complete protein comes from animal foods. The essential fats in the form that we need them come from animal foods. So that's DHA and EPA. It's not ALA, which is the form of the uh, fatty acids that is found in plants. And the plant-based people will say, well, you know, people can convert. Yes, yeah, some people can, not all people. And surely it's better for the body to have the food in the form that it needs it. So then you go on to micronutrients. So there's no debate. There are 13 vitamins, four fat-soluble vitamins, and then um, nine water-soluble vitamins, the eight B vitamins, and then you've got vitamin C, water-soluble. They also come in forms that the body wants. And in every circumstance, when there is a form that the body wants, it comes from animal foods. So retinol comes from animal foods, carotene comes from plant foods, D3 comes from animal foods and the sunshine, D2 comes from plant foods, B12 only comes from animal foods. Um, you move mm -hmm. on to the minerals, and of course the most absorbable form of zinc and iron is in animal foods. Invaluable sources of calcium are oily fish, dairy products, eggs, again, you're back to your animal food. So principle two, choose that real food for the nutrients it provides. If you follow that principle, you will eat meat, and red meat is more nutritious than white meat. You will eat fish, and oily fish is more nutritious than white fish. You will eat eggs, especially the yolks. You may as well throw away the white, not the other way around. And you'll eat full fat dairy products. Now there are other foods that are useful. Sunflower seeds are useful. Um, green things are useful. Some legumes are pretty nutrient dense, but they will never be an animal food. So if a, a plant-based person wants to have a nutrition fight with you and you pick an animal-based food, and I'll tell you straight away, the one to pick is liver. I don't like it, but it's the one that will win and you will win the nutrient competition. So that's rule yeah. number two. And it takes you down the animal red meat, oily fish, full fat dairy, dairy root. There, there is no other conclusion that you can come to. The nutrients are not found in the plants. I'm sorry, but they're just not. And then rule number three is eat a maximum of three times a day. We have got to realize the orchestra that we set off in the body the minute we put something with a calorie in our mouth and the minute there's a calorie, you've got a macronutrient. So you've got protein, fat or carbohydrate. You've got something, or alcohol, of course, you've got something that the body has to deal with. And if you could see what the body has to do in terms of getting sugar out of the glucose, um, out of the bloodstream, what it has to do to chop up essential fats, complete proteins, get the nutrients travels around the body, da, 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 da. you would not do that 15 times a day, which is what some people are. They're just grazing the whole time. Just stop yeah. the grazing. We, we're, we're not animals that should graze. Leave that to the cows. So that, that's my top level. And I, and I like to think your colleague would struggle a little bit with that one. Yeah, I appreciate that because you keep it so simple. It's like first principles, like what do we need? What provides those nutrients? Stick to that. Like anything else is not really essential. It's, you know, if you like the taste, sure. Um, I think one of the biggest struggles that advocates for like a low carb diet and everybody kind of in the circle that we listen to talk to is that is the frustration of the, uh, the aim of the guidelines to do like a for forced function to force you to eat the plants, eat whatever they're, they're selling. Right. Um, I think if there wasn't as much of that forceful 
nature behind certain papers or behind certain ways of communication, then probably wouldn't be as as much of a a pushback. But it's that that extra force where people ha- that we have to start uh, sharing the the proper information so patients are aware of, um, so that they can make the decisions on their own account. Yeah. Question the motive. So who gains if we're told to eat plant food rather than animal food? There's really not much margin. You, you talk to a farmer like Peter Ballastad or so on, or Gareth Wynne Jones over here in Wales. There's just so little margin in real quality meat, dairy, cheese, fish, really, really low margin. But take some cereal, try to get people to have cereal instead of eggs for breakfast, which is what the dietary guidelines do. And you can put it in a box, yeah. you can put a toy in it, you can do marketing. You can take basically 10 cents worth of product and sell it for four bucks. Great product. Yeah. One thing that I want to kind of bring up here um, is one of the slides that, that you've created, which I found very helpful. I think I even brought it up to one of my patients, this one. Can you oh, see yeah, it? Oh, yeah, I like that one. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to yeah. kind of run through this slide quickly? Yeah. Um, I, I ha- it's about helping me. When I came into this, I was never taught nutrition at school. Um, I did maths and economics at Cambridge. I then went into human resources. So when I came into the food arena, it, I had to understand, you know, what do you mean there's two forms of vitamin A and, and I'm not getting what I need. And then I realized why I'd had some eye trouble while I was eating a plant-based diet. Um, so I have to kind of understand things for myself. So I get to the point where I say, okay, what do we eat? We eat macronutrients. What are those three macronutrients? Carbohydrate, fat, and protein. Um, so where do we find those foods and what are they? And, we, and can we put all the things that we actually eat into some kind of overall framework so it helps me to make sense of it? So then you, you start doing a bit of investigation. You say, oh, this is really interesting because there is actually only one pure carbohydrate on the planet, which is the blue bar over on the left-hand side, and that is sucrose. What we know as table sugar has no vitamins, no minerals, um, has nothing of any value whatsoever. It's just complete useless junk, no protein, no fat. So it's entirely on blue over on the left-hand side. Over on the right-hand side, you've got the 100% fats, and those would be things like olive oil, um, coconut oil, rapeseed oil, sunflower oil, and so on. Not butter, interestingly, because butter has got some protein. Um, so butter starts sort of moving in towards the center. But then the next massive realization that I made, and this was when I was trying to understand obesity, is that nature tends to provide, the real food around us, is it comes in essentially carb proteins or fat proteins because outside of those two extremes where you've got pure carbohydrate or pure fat protein is in everything and that's another really interesting finding so people say oh you need to eat all these different things to get protein no there's protein in lettuce there's protein in an apple there's protein in bed yeah, yeah there's loads of protein in white fish and chicken breast but there's actually protein in everything so as long as you start eating the right proteins you're actually not going to struggle to get protein but then you realize that nature kind of provides carb proteins which is what vegans plant-based people would eat and that's your fruit vegetables grains um, and what we call legumes which is beans and pulses and then nature provides fat proteins, which are the things that the vegans wouldn't eat. And that's your meat, fish, eggs and dairy. Um, and that was another fascination for me because there are only a couple of foods in nature where you've got carbohydrate, fat and protein all in good measure. And those are your nuts and seeds and avocados. But the really interesting one in among all of those is nuts, because how many people will tell you when you start eating nuts, you just can't stop? Um, it would be yeah. a, a binge food um, for certain people in, in the real food world. You, you could overeat nuts quite easily. Um, and my theory on that is you can overeat them quite easily because they are quite unique in nature. They are this fat carb combination that nature just doesn't usually provide, but human beings find it completely irresistible. So I then say to people, OK, if I give you a carb protein, so I give you dry bread or dry crackers, and say how much can you eat you won't be able to eat very much so if i go over to a fat protein and say right there's a block of cheese um just keep going you might be able to eat more cheese than you could the crackers but you've got a limit 
Then I say to you, mm-hmm. right, you can have the cheese and the crackers together or the cheese and the bread together. You've got no limit because you're yeah. in that fat carb combo. Um, and the fake food manufacturers, and again, this kind of ties in my background in HR coming into the nutrition world. I've been around food science labs. I've seen the guinea pigs, and they're usually students. They're usually your age, and they line them up against these little hatches, and they put through a food, and then they say, right, score it for taste, palatability, aftertaste. What did you think of it? How long was it in your mouth? Was it creamy enough? Was it smooth enough? And then you give the feedback, you and 20 other people, and then they adapt the recipe, and then they give you it, and they just go at it until it's Pringles or it's Dunkin' Donuts. Um, It is completely irresistible. Once you start eating it, you just will not be able to stop, and that will be because it will be the perfect carb-fat combo that nature doesn't make, so you haven't evolved to be able to cope with it and you will be able to overeat it like there's no tomorrow. So that is food to me. That is food in our environment. Don't worry about protein. Fats, by the way, are really not that nutritious. All these people say, no, olive oil is a wonder food. Coconut oil is a wonder food. No, they're not. They've got no complete protein. They've got a couple of fat soluble vitamins. Of course they have because they're fats. They've got no minerals. They've got no um, water soluble vitamins because they're 100% fat. They're really not all that. Um, Olive oil really isn't anything special. Don't go around thinking that's why Mediterranean people live longer. It's not why they live longer. It's the sunshine. Yeah. And would you then, so just in regards to the fats, would you lean towards like using tallow to cook? Well, I I would always go for natural fats that come from animals. So um, my hubby's the chef in our household. So if hubby's cooking a pork joint or a beef joint, he'll save the fat. Um, and then it will tend to solidify. Um, Oh, that's another interesting thing about fat that we might end up getting onto. People talk about certain foods as if they're full of saturated fat or they're entirely saturated fat or whatever. And that is another complete myth. So any food that contains fat, and you've now seen that you've got pure fats, you've got the animal foods, you've also actually got a trace of fat in most of the stuff on the left-hand side, but it's just predominantly carb protein. That's another little fact about fat. But any food that has fat contains all three fats, saturated, monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated. So when people say, oh, red meat is full of saturated fat, it's not even the major fat. Um, Red meat is mostly water, then it's mostly protein, you'll probably have 7% fat in a sirloin steak. Of those seven percentage points of fat, only two are gonna be saturated. I've looked at this, I put it up on another slide in conferences. So this whole idea that you can avoid saturated fat and only Mm monounsaturated fat or polyunsaturated fats as well is, is another complete and utter myth. There is not one single food on this planet that you could eat that is entirely one fat and not the other two. Yeah, I think when I listened to one of your lectures about that, I was I was surprised because I, I haven't looked into it. Um, but it's good to know that there is saturated saturated fat in a lot of foods, and it's not the primary one in red meat because so many people are afraid of, of it. And I remember reading through uh, it's like a burden of proof study. I'm not sure if you came across it, in October mm-hmm. 2022, looking at how saturated fat is not associated with increasing type 2 diabetes, stroke, atherosclerosis. Um, did you get? Did you ever break down that, that study or do you remember it? I do, I can't remember if I did one. I know um, there was another one around the same time where the Global Burden of Disease team, and they're always trying to damn red meat, and they've done something where from their previous report to the current one, the, the, the damnation of red meat had just gone up by multiple factors. And then there's a guy that I know over in Belgium, Frederick Loire, and he and a team from Ireland had kind of taken that apart. So if someone else has done it, I kind of don't have to do it as well. I'm quite, there's so many papers. We, we need to sort of divide and split up. You know, if I see that Rob Wolf has done something or Nina Teicholz or what, it's like, great, okay. And we, and we email each other, you know, it's like, great, you've done that one, I'm going yeah. to do another one. Um, but no, it's, it's it's utterly insane, the idea that, there is anything in any real natural food that is trying to harm us in any way. How would we have got here? You know, we've been yeah. eating animals for, I mean, since man first walked up, right? Australopithecus, Lucy, how long ago was that? I don't know. 500,000 years or something. 
and you look at the cave paintings you know they're not boiling up legumes and making a lentil dal or something you know you, the, the cave paintings are man and it is always man man with spear chasing animals mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they're telling us mm -hmm. what they ate um and and the animals have all the nutrients so again why would nature do that why would nature say you've got to eat the red meat because you need the iron and the zinc and all the b vitamins and the essential fats and the complete proteins but ah we chuck something in that's gonna fur up your arteries at the same time just to you know just to have a little bit of a sense of humor or something and the other thing is how does yeah. food even fur up your arteries um you know you eat your food yeah. right you don't inject it into your bloodstream so I eat my food, it goes down the esophagus, it starts going into the digestive system, it goes into the stomach, it goes into the lower intestine, it goes into um, lymphatic system and it gets packaged out to take the nutrients around the body. When did any of that food jump out of my digestive system and leap its way into my arteries to clog up my arteries? I mean, the whole, they've created this incredibly visual scam i remember there was a public health video in the uk about 20 years ago and they had somebody um sticking fat pure solidified lard tallow whatever down the sink and oh. saying it will block up your sink and it will block up your arteries in just the same way and it's like yeah if i slice yeah. off my arm and start trying to shove it into my arteries i imagine it probably would clog them up but by that point i'm going to be dead anyway um, how does it eat? Oh, I mean, the more you look at nutrition, the more mental it gets. And oh, I don't a know, good, I get... yeah, <laughs> that's a good old old school right. Uh, commercial, right? To scare people with that that horrible visual. Um, I think we covered a little bit of saturated fat, maybe even like why there's this demonization of meat. Obviously, like you said, you have to consider the intentions of big food, big pharma, where's all the money going, coming from and where's it going? Um, is there, I had a conversation with one of my supervisors about, about this very nice guy. He's one of our research uh, leads. And so we're just having a conversation about triglycerides and HDL and LDL. Do you think like from the studies, the issue is uh, with, with just cholesterol in general, is it LDL or is it the fact that people just have low HDL because when we were having a discussion, he said, you know, it, he doesn't agree that LDL seems to be the issue. It's, it looks like if people have a low HDL, then they tend to have, you know, worse, worse outcomes. Okay. Um, God, where do I start with this one? I do not personally see cholesterol as an is any issue whatsoever. Absolutely no okay. issue whatsoever. So, the body is making cholesterol. My body's making cholesterol right now. Your body's making cholesterol right now. We'll both probably make more cholesterol when we're asleep because that's kind of what the body does. It does all the repair and maintenance then. Um, it's making it because it is utterly life vital and we would die without it. And people don't seem to realize that. So if by some miracle, um, let's say a statin uh, completely removed all cholesterol from the body in just one, one tablet, we would be a puddle on the floor there would be no cell left intact. There's no cell integrity, there's no cell structure. Um, it is the mm -hmm. essence of life. And the body has a pathway, the mevalinate pathway, by which it is making cholesterol. Um, and there are other sort of byproducts of the pathway. So example, CoQ10 is further down the mevalinate pathway. And CoQ10 is also called sort of the body's energy spark plug, which is why when some people take statins, they end up feeling that their get up and go has got up and gone, they lose their um, energy they also can lose their minds because the brain hosts or the um, yeah the brain hosts 25 percent of the cholesterol in the body so they can find they lose their memory they lose their mind you can lose your muscle benefit it, it can do real harm and I kind of just again at a top level I'm a really simple sort of let's get up into the helicopter and let's see what's going on here kind of place why would the body have a pathway to make an utterly life vital substance without which we would immediately die and then it'd be a good idea to block that pathway so mm -hmm. i starting point i do not see cholesterol as a problem at all i see um, the body is making cholesterol the body is making the cholesterol that it needs to now i did think maybe cholesterol is a marker maybe it's one of those things that it's telling us something um, it doesn't necessarily mean that we should be lowering it, kind of like I'm a bit 
I'm curious about blood pressure as well. Blood pressure is a marker to me. It's a really useful marker. And then we just medicate. We don't try to work out why has this person got high blood pressure. Actually, there's an incredible normal distribution with blood pressure, as there is with cholesterol. Um, and the normal mm. distribution is normal because it is the normal distribution. So the normal distribution for cholesterol probably goes from 3 to 10. So somebody's going to have 10. But of course, the medical profession has decided that 5 is too high. And therefore, they just kind of want to shift the whole normal distribution. The same with blood pressure. The true normal blood pressure was 140 over 90. Um, and then we put loads of people on blood pressure meds. And then suddenly you're being told you've got high blood pressure. It's 130 over 85 or whatever. So to me, there is no issue with cholesterol. And because there is no issue with cholesterol, the, the whole LDL, HDL thing, and this is going to be a bit of a mind shift for some people as well, if you stop talking to me about cholesterol and you start talking to me about HDL, LDL, chylomicrons, triglycerides, which are VLDL by another name, then we're not having a conversation about cholesterol anymore. We're having a conversation about lipoproteins. So okay. are you now worried about lipoproteins or are you still worried about cholesterol? Because if you're worried about cholesterol, I really don't think you need to be. And then when people start saying, oh, well, okay, I'm not worried about total cholesterol, but I'm worried about LDL cholesterol, but I think HDL cholesterol is really good. It's like they're the same substance. The chemical formula for cholesterol is C27H46O, and there is no good or bad version. Cholesterol is cholesterol is cholesterol. So in lipoproteins, we should probably quickly explain what lipoproteins are. So um, if I took my beaker of, ooh, put it in camera here, if I took my beaker of water here, and I got some olive oil and I drip some olive oil in the water. It won't mix because fat and water right. don't mix. That's the analogy for blood being water and the olive oil being lipids that need to travel around our bloodstream to reach the cells to do their vital work. So the body has come up with this fantastic system and it says, OK, we're going to have these things called lipoproteins. I think of them as taxis. And these little taxis are going to go in the bloodstream to transport the vital cargo and they're going to be water friendly on the outside for the blood and they're going to be fat friendly on the inside for the lipids. And those lipoproteins are all carrying cholesterol, phospholipids, triglycerides and protein, all of them just in different amounts. So the HDL is just a high density lipoprotein. It's just smaller than the LDL, which is a low density lipoprotein. So it's less tightly compressed they have different amounts of cholesterol different amounts of protein triglycerides and all the rest of it but they're both just taxis and they're both taxis that carry cholesterol so why yeah there you go brilliant and and that's not a bad um size dimension as well so someone someone has done that to size so the chylomicron yeah. which is the one when you've eaten um your lovely steak and you've got some saturated fat monounsaturated fats, polyunsaturated fats, but more importantly, you've got the fat soluble vitamins and nutrients. The chylomicron is the one in the lymphatic system. The body will package those nutrients out onto the chylomicrons and they start going off around the body with the intent of dropping off that cargo to the cells that need it. Now, in a separate yeah. universe, the liver is making very low density lipoproteins. They're also called triglycerides, which gets a little bit confusing. So the liver's making the VLDL. Now, VLDL, as part of its process, kind of shrinks, keeping it simple, shrinks down to what we call intermediate density lipoproteins, IDL. They then shrink down and they become LDL. Now, some people then say, oh, so OK, so if your VLDL goes up, then your LDL will go up. Now, Dr. Malcolm Kendrick, who studied this more than anyone else I know, he's devoted his life to looking at what really causes heart disease. He's saying, well, actually, that is not the case. The amount of VLDL that you have doesn't actually determine the amount of LDL you have. So that's a, another issue for another day. The idea that HDL, another taxi is good, but all those taxis to the left are bad, is just nuts. It's back, you know, we were only in mad world insane this doesn't make sense a couple of minutes ago we're back in mad world insane it doesn't make sense they're just taxis the body didn't design four bad taxis and one good taxi they are all made by the exquisite functioning of the body for very very good reason so the vldl is taking cargo away from the liver and it shrinks down to become ideal and ldl so kind of think of ldl as the taxi that's taking stuff to the cells and then the HDL taxi will be picking 
any stuff not used up by the cell and taken it back to the liver. Now again, if cholesterol I was see. so deadly, why would it take it back to the liver? It doesn't excrete it from the body, it doesn't treat it like a waste waste product, it takes it back to the, the liver where it can be recycled and then packaged out again. So I, I want to sort of scream at people sometimes, they, they talk about cholesterol and then they just slip into LDL and HDL seamlessly. It's like, whoa, 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 right, we're not talking about cholesterol anymore. We're talking about lipoproteins. So what's your beef with lip lipoproteins? You know, t tell me, what, what's your issue with lipoproteins? Because you are no longer in the diet, heart, fat, cholesterol hypothesis. You are now arguing with me on lipoproteins. And so you've got to forget cholesterol and you've got to tell me what your issue is with lipoproteins and why you think you know better than the body because the body has designed all of that and that's how we've lived since we became humankind and you're now trying to block mm -hmm. that pathway. You're now trying to say that some of those are bad and some of those are good and then you get people going into, oh, and then you've got small dense LDL and then you've got large fluffy LDL and all that kind of thing. It's like, apart from the fact, I now really just want to find a wall and start banging my head against it and like, could that be, you know, are we going to get to peak stupidity in this podcast at some point? <laughs> Apart from that, you're back talking about lipoproteins. So, okay, but stop talking about cholesterol. People, they don't even understand what they're talking about. They, you know, when you sit down with your doctor and you have a blood test, I mean, I don't because it's just too stupid. I, I, I upset myself. But I did once for a company medical and a doctor saying to me, oh, you're... Um, your bad cholesterol is really low and your good cholesterol is really high. And I'm like, I'm the maths graduate from Cambridge and you're the medic. And that's just come out of your mouth. I mean, like, guys, this is in, this is nuts. This is nuts. Right. Should we try and not say this is nuts too many more times during whatever <laughs> time we've got left? <laughs> um, well, I appreciate that explaining exactly what LDI I certainly learned something from I uh, learned something from that and I think we definitely don't in, in medical school because um, we have so much we learn and learn it so fast and we just kind of have to take it apply it write the test and kind of move on again just kind of trusting the guidelines I think not many doctors really sit down and think about the nuances of the conversations and I think there's just so much nuance being missed through papers podcasts and just uh, in general um, was there we we touched a little bit about uh, it's going to be kind of transitioning uh, this the sustainability issue um, that people think there is with meat. Is there like are you, do you have something you could quickly share about maybe some numbers uh, that people could kind of grasp and, and think about? I often hear you know agriculture contributing to I don't know three or four percent of like CO two emissions and I think that's such a big one that I hear doctors that I talk to um, as reasons for not eating animal-based foods. Um, what are your thoughts about that? Oh, again, where do, where do I start on that one? Um, I might upset some of your listeners here because I don't buy the whole CO2 is bad. In fact, the parallels between the diet heart hypothesis and the CO2 hypothesis are actually really similar. So we've demonized, in the nutrition world, we've demonized cholesterol and cholesterol is utterly life vital. And in kind of the environment world, we've demonized CO2 and CO2 is also utterly life vital. Um, we, we just die instantly without it. And interestingly, to grow plants in greenhouses, you pump a shed load of CO2 into the greenhouse. That's how they, that's how they cultivate plants. So in the environment generally, and a lot of people, if you get into a green debate, they don't know these kind of numbers. Um, so CO2 in the, in the environment is about 400 parts per million. And it's generally then accepted that if man, mankind has any impact over that, it's probably only um, at about 12 parts per million. So you're into the mm. most minute impact anyway. You can then look back over history and say, we've had CO2 much higher, we've had CO2 much lower, way pre-industrialization. So it's really difficult to even see an association between industrialization, what mankind is doing and CO2 being higher. There was also a paper that came out very recently, which makes complete sense, which is if there is any relationship between CO2 and warming, it's far more likely that the warming precedes the rise in CO2. 
So again, you've got the greenhouse. Um, if you've got the greenhouse and it moves from spring into summer and it starts getting really warm in the summer, the CO2 level in the greenhouse will rise more naturally. You won't have to pump quite so much CO2 in. So if there is a relationship, it could well be the other way around. So I'm really struggling with that one as well. I see that as another thing. If you look at, I'm always looking at motive. Who gains from demonizing cholesterol? Who gains from the idea that if you're a religious person, God got it wrong. If you're not a religious person, that nature got it wrong. Um, that the body should not have a mevalinate pathway. Who gains from blocking that mevalinate pathway? Well, clearly pharmaceutical companies do. Um, who yeah. gains from some of the environmental stuff that's gone on over the last years? Oh, my goodness. Well, Al Gore is right up at the top of the people who've gained um, from all of this. People who've invested in wind and solar. Um, alternative energies um, and of course it lends very nicely into the plant-based agenda now I don't normally come at it from that side I wouldn't normally even get into that debate because it is a little bit controversial I would normally mm -hmm. come at it in my usual style from the principal debate which is okay let's look at what plant food contributes to the earth and let's look at what animal foods contribute to the earth because at the end of the day there are two ways that we can continue to feed the population. We can feed the population in the way that we have done since time began, which is in fields, using soil and traditional farming. And yes, there's a lot more fertilizers than we've ever used, but we're still essentially grazing animals on land and tilling fields and, and barley and, and all the rest of it. So we, we're still largely doing that. Too many cow sheds and chickens cooped up in concrete boxes, but that's a, a separate issue. Um, mm -hmm. But then, of course, we've got this whole sort of factory production and now they want to move the food supply into the factories. So we need to protect topsoil. And I'm members of organisations like the Soil Association, the Sustainable Food Trust, the Farming Association, Pasture Fed Livestock. I support a lot of um, organisations and farmers who are trying to preserve topsoil because without topsoil, human beings have no ability to naturally feed themselves. So if you've, I live in Wales, I live in the countryside, I go for a walk every morning. Um, on the days it rains, it's like a brown river flowing down the road and it breaks my heart because I know what that is. And it's topsoil being washed off the top of the land and it goes into the drains and it ends up in the sea and it never comes back into the fields as topsoil. So that is topsoil being mm. eroded and when it's gone, it's gone. Um, we used to have topsoil that was several feet thick. It's now inches thick, and in some places it's it's millimetres thick. Um, without that topsoil, we can't grow plants or we can't graze animals. So we actually need right. to be going back to what happened in the agricultural revolution, um, which was started in England. The three-field system was the perfect system. So you have the farmer has groups of three fields, and in year one... Uh, he'll have the grazing animals and in year two he'll put the crops in because they're benefiting from the rich soil that the animal animals have churned up and cultivated and then in year three he leaves the field fallow because it's got to recover and then the animals can go back in and they get their food and they churn it up and that's what we're supposed to be doing with nature. We don't do that anymore, particularly, dare I say, in North America. We still have animals grazing in the fields here in Wales and England. In North America, there are too many massive concrete farms where cows and sheep or whatever are in terrible, terrible conditions. And they're not giving back to the land. And that's where mm -hmm. they calculate things like, oh, this is the methane that they're producing and all the rest. Of it. I mean, forget that. Just go back to the principle of how are animals supposed to be living they are supposed to be part of our symbiotic relationship with nature where they protect our soil that we need for our food we eat them we eat the food that they then also enable us to grow and we live in this harmony we're, we're supposed to eat them they're supposed to protect our topsoil for us we've taken them away from that topsoil that's going to be to our detriment and if they want to let's say the vegans won a global election overnight and said right there's no more animal production um they would just let all the pigs cows sheep goats chickens die out presumably they wouldn't kill them they just let them die out once they're gone they're gone 
and then we have no ruminants, the animals that can actually graze the land and give back to the topsoil. So then the topsoil um, destruction accelerates. Then we have, uh, they already think we've only got about 90 harvests left. Maybe then we've got nine harvests left. Maybe then in 10 years, no. we could destroy the surface of the planet. And then you can't even grow the plant food in the fields. Not even mm -hmm. fertilizers will then be able to help you. So what then happens? Um, I can't remember the word for it, but if you Google um, greenhouses, growing food upside down in greenhouses, it's something in a tray or something like that. Um, you, you can see images uh, that are already starting to blight our landscape. And that's where they don't even bother trying to protect topsoil. They've just put a massive greenhouse on top of the land and they're growing the food upside down in the greenhouses. Why upside down? Because they're, they're not using soil. Um, so they hang it right. from the ceiling and then it grows down with gravity rather than growing up with the nourishment from the soil. Now, the, the minerals that we need, go back to what do we need to eat? The minerals come from the ground. So the minerals either get to us through the plants that the animals digest and we then digest the animals, or they come to us directly from the plants that we eat that the animals helped us to eat. So veg, veg are great. I'm, I'm not particularly low carb. Um, potatoes, things that naturally come from the ground, root vegetables, green things, um, nuts and seeds, great minerals galore. Um, but this whole demonization of cattle, if you were in some James Bond movie, you'd say the end in mind would be that the fake food companies control the entire global food supply because we would lose our ability to grow food. That'd be a good point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so it's really important, a really important point that you shared it there that uh, I've been also trying to learn a little bit more about um, is just having, trying to encourage more of that regenerative farming, which you, you do through through buying, through building awareness. It's not easy. It's definitely more expensive. I think if you can't afford that to just, just buy meat, uh, which is fine, doesn't have to be regenerative, but that's definitely the the goal that we want to go towards. And I think it's really important just for those who might be a little bit uh, anti-meat to understand that like we need the ruminants, we need them to stomp the ground, we need their manure to fertilize everything, right? And it's not, we can't just, we can't just eliminate animals, we can't just eliminate cholesterol, like all these things were here before us. Um, and it's part of, of our ecosystem. And so it's just learning how to manage uh, the ecosystem, how to balance that soil, how to, because with the healthy soil, we have healthy plants with healthy plants, we have healthy animals, and therefore we have, we can have healthy humans. Um, and so I really appreciate you kind of going on for explaining for a couple minutes, the importance of understanding each step of the way, because I, I don't think a lot of people really take the time to, to think about these processes. It's so easy to to see something on social media and become an activist or read some quick research article saying, oh, plants reverse diabetes, uh, so plant-based foods is the way to go without considering the other side. I had a, a supervisor come in with a 10, 12 minute, because we just had a, our lectures about quality improvement projects, so we're starting one. And one of the things that this doctor presented on is how we need to eat like a real food diet, right? Eliminate the processed carbs. And from research, plants is real food. And they have seen that if you eat more plant-based, then you can, you know, avoid or reverse type 2 diabetes. There's less heart de heart disease and it's healthier for the, the uh, environment. And I remember listening to this and my blood was boiling. And all my classmates know that my blood was boiling <laughs> because... They know I interviewed Anthony Chafee, a carnivore, and I'm, I talk to them all the time about meat and other things. Um, and so it's just kind of it was ironic. I had to sit through that. And I disagreed, but I, I, I agree that we have to eat real food. I just disagree um, about the elimination of, of meat. Absolutely. And the, the whole sort of plants and diabetes, how does that make sense? Because diabetes is essentially the inability to handle glucose you've got an issue with glucose. Um, either in a type one, you're not making any insulin, so your body can't take the glucose out of the bloodstream, or in a type two, I kind of think of type two diabetes as your, your body saying enough is enough. You've put in too much carbohydrate too often, mm -hmm. 
every time you do it, I'm only supposed to have four grams of glucose in my entire bloodstream, in the whole five litres of blood. And you ate an apple, and that was 20 grams that I had to deal with. And then you had a, you know, and you just did it all day long, and you've done it for 20 years, and you don't have these two or three meals a day, you know, one meal a day we probably used to have, or one meal every two or three days. Um, you're just grazing the whole damn time. It's a M and M here and a piece of popcorn there, um, and I, I I can't do it anymore. I can't keep taking the glucose out in the way that you want me to. It's just not happening anymore. You call it insulin resistance. You call it metabolic syndrome. You call it whatever you want. I call it the body saying enough is enough. Now go back to the colour diagram that um, that I use that you put up. Um, you've got the plant based foods, so the carb proteins. But the key word there is carbs. So meat, uh, sorry, veg, fruit, legumes and grains all deliver glucose into the bloodstream. So how do they help diabetes? Now, yeah. if you took somebody with a horrifically bad diet who's also got obesity and they're eating junk food and Dunkin' Donuts and whatever all day long, and you took that person and put them on a plant-based diet and they lost quite a bit of weight, that would help their diabetes. But it wasn't the plants that did it, it was coming off the junk food and losing a great amount of weight. If you'd have put them on a yeah. real food, low-carb diet with lots of nutrient-dense meat, fish, eggs and dairy, they'd have done even better and probably be more able to stick to it because they, they'll get hungry on the plant-based diet. Yeah, that's what I noticed too. Um, I mean, I think a lot of people can agree, we can all agree, that the, it's the elimination of the processed carbs that is the primary benefit. Uh, but then I still, I get patients that come back and they're seeing a dietitian and they're recommended to eat five, six times a day, small meals, plant-based and grains. I'm like, ah, like I can't really, say anything at least at this stage as a resident i just you know they're being followed by a dietitian so let them kind of do that but if there's somebody else that isn't being followed I'll let them know like eat something that's satiating fat meat like your body craves protein once you hit your macros there like you're not going to be wanting to eat a lot like eat carbs for last if you're going to eat any um because then you just won't be able to overeat as much um yeah. but yeah that's something that i try to teach my patients it's like you don't need five or six meals you just need the nutrients you yeah, need the essentials the, the, yeah the, the teaspoon thing then that's the one that works for me in, in that position because you can literally hold up a teaspoon with uh, full of um, table sugar and th that's your four grams of sugar now yeah table sugar is glucose and fructose so what you're saying is you've got four grams of glucose in the bloodstream and then you say to them okay so you want to have your breakfast and then you want to have an apple mid-morning. So an apple, decent sized apple, is probably 20 grams of carbohydrate. And of that 20 grams of carbohydrate is, is pretty much entirely sugars. Um, you've got some fructose and you've got some glucose. And the glucose is the bit that's going to go straight into the bloodstream. And then the fructose is the stuff that goes into non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So when people hmm. say to me, oh, which is best, glucose or fructose? I say, well, which do you want, type 2 diabetes or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? It's your choice. Yeah, they're both sugar. They're just sugar. Fruit is essentially sugar. I love fruit. Don't get me wrong. I could eat fruit all day long. It's like sweeties. Um, but I don't kid myself that it's healthy. So if you can say to that patient, okay, so let's think about that apple. That's 20 grams of sugar. Let's say it's 10 grams of glucose. You only need four in your bloodstream at any one time. And you're not empty right now. You're at number four. Unless you've got some mm -hmm. hyperglycemia or diabetes thing going on, you're at, you're at the right number already. It, it's the body's job to make sure you stay at that number. So you put in 10 grams from that apple, you are at the right level. You've now gone two and a half times higher than you were supposed to be. So immediately the body's got to wake up the pancreas, say, yo, insulin, sugar alert in the bloodstream, go and attach yourself to that glucose, take it out of the bloodstream, store it away in the storage room. And yeah, fine, if you use that up with a, within a 24 hour period, it's not gonna give you a weight problem. But if you don't use that up within 24 hours, the body turns it into fat because the body's yeah. only got the capacity to store about 14, 1500 grams uh, sorry, calories worth of carbohydrate in the body. Uh, that's only about 400 grams of carbohydrate. So the, when you get to your larder being full, your storage room for 
glucose glycogen stored form of glucose carbohydrate body says right i'm now turning that into fat and then you do the whole thing the next day you have plants for breakfast you have an apple mid-morning you have your um whole grain whatever for lunch you have your healthy cereal bar in the afternoon you have your low fat pasta whatever you just carb 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 all day long and that's how you end up type 2 diabetic yeah yeah it's true I want to kind of kind of remaining on the the topic of meat like protein but just switching what we're looking at here um at the beginning I remember if you remember I told you about a uh, the doctor that pointed me towards you I just want to make sure can you hear me right now Yes, I can see you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are pixelating okay. a bit and you do break up every now and again, but I've not lost the gist of what you're saying yet, so don't worry. Okay, that's great. Um, I asked him to send me a couple of questions because I know he appreciates your work so much. And so this is one of the questions. Um, what are your thoughts on ideal protein intake and bioavailability in women at various ages when it comes to plant and animal protein? And should we be advocating for more protein in peri and postmenopausal women for bone and muscle health as they age? Good question. There's a, there's a lot in there. Um, keep it simple. Animal protein above plant protein every time. Um, I, again, I'm quite a, 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 a sort of simple principle kind of person when it comes to this. So I'm not someone who ever advises people to count things. So I don't say... Um, work out your grams of protein or count this or count that. I just, again, come at it from principle. So I would say if you eat protein in the way that it comes in food, I don't think you can go far wrong. So don't cut the skin off a chicken breast. Skinless chicken breasts are too high in protein relative to the fat that you were supposed to eat with them. Um, if you're having some pork, the pork chop comes with some fat, don't go and eat everyone else's fat, particularly if you've got a weight problem. Don't go stupid, but eat the fat that naturally comes with your food. So if you've got a marbled ribeye or whatever, eat the fat that naturally comes with your ribeye. Don't go for low-fat dairy. You need the fat nutrients, and they're finding in the, the high-fat dairy or whatever. So as long as you're not doing stupid protein things, which to me are white fish, not oily fish, chicken, skinless breasts, Protein shakes, I just think, are truly evil. Um, you know, do not be doing those, young guys. It's probably the fastest way to liver problems, vitamin A depletion, known to mankind. Just stop it. Eat real food, number one principle. Um, and I think if you're if you're following our, our guidelines of eat real food, choose the food for the nutrients it provides and eat no more than three times a day. If you don't like breakfast, don't have it, but don't go and have five meals you won't mm -hmm. have to worry about it too much because nature has put the stuff out there for you. You're going to be okay. Um, if you then stopped for a while, and particularly if you try to get some variety in your diet, and then you put what you eat on a weekly basis into an app, you should be really pleasantly surprised. Oh yeah, I am getting my zinc. I am getting my DHA and my EPA. I'm getting kind of what I need and I am getting the protein that I need. Um, I don't know, I, I, I wouldn't advise people as they age, not just women, you know, yes, menopausal women, but just people generally as they age. Of course, we have to worry about sarcopenia, which is the loss of um, muscle, muscle mass, basically, muscle definition, muscle strength. Um, I, I still don't think you should do anything daft, like still don't go and start having skinless chicken breasts and only white fish and starting protein shakes. Um, right. I'd say make sure you keep up getting the protein so don't a lot of women i think when they get to menopausal age and they start worrying more about their weight so then they might be tempted to go more low fat dairy for example that that seems to be an easy choice for people to make oh if i didn't have proper milk in the morning i could save loads of calories kind of thing that wrong thing to do is it's the fat that goes with the protein that, that you need for the satiety so you, you need to keep those up so i say more of the same thing and you're not going to enter the menopause with a weight problem if you're following those principles avoiding junk food um and also doing other healthy things like um weight bearing exercise um yeah. regular you know mix it up I, i'm a huge fan of crossfit um i mean i think in the earlier slide it was very nice you saw me present presenting in a summer dress or whatever and I was thinking oh yeah I had the arms then and I've just got yeah. back from holiday you probably see from the color it's like yeah the arms have been out I got pretty good arms actually um and yeah. that's being um normal you know low to normal body weight so I 
everyone's got muscles it's just a lot of people have got them covered we've all got a six pack but just in a lot of people it's it's covered with body fat so you have to get to a low enough body fat to, to unpack it um but then it's mm -hmm. actually about using your muscles in a natural way so lifting things and swimming and crawling around on the floor and doing yoga and, and all of that kind of good stuff okay so kind of just continue uh it's really easy continue eating your meat don't avoid it uh, if you're not eating enough meat, then obviously add it, but don't trim away the fat. Eat it the way God kind of packaged it for you. And uh, I would, I I would lean toward just eat animal meat because you um, absorb most of it. Actually, can you touch upon? Do you know what the bioavailability of protein is, and like plants and animal protein? Like, is there some web uh, tool online that we can use to figure that out? And is is that important? Um yeah, I mean, there probably is, but for me, it's more the complete protein. So again, there's an article on my website. I'm trying to think what you would put in to call it out. It, it might be the word chickpeas, um, or it might be animal versus plant protein. But I saw something on um, Medscape once, and it said, um, oh, uh, chickpeas are just as good as eggs or something. So I thought, okay, that's going to be my Monday note, because that is just complete nonsense. Um, and yeah. I went through all the amino acids in chickpeas and um and comparing them with eggs and of course they're incomparable because going back to what we have to eat what is an essential nutrient essential in nutrition means something we must eat the body doesn't make it so there are nine essential amino acids and not only are they found more in animal protein they're found in the right proportions in animal protein so i think when i go through that exercise with the chickpeas and the eggs yeah, they've got those essential amino acids, but they don't have the right amount and they don't have it in the right ratio. So you end up, and I forget which one it is, I think lysine is one of them, um, or methy yeah. or whatever, <clears throat> you just don't quite get enough. And so you say, oh, well, you can just eat more so you can get more, but then you're in the wrong balance because then you were getting too many of the other things. Um, remember, I was veggie for, for 20 years, so I am not coming at this from a... Um, I don't actually like eating meat. I don't tell people that very often. I am a natural, I am a natural vegetarian. Um, if what we eat had no impact on weight or health whatsoever, I would eat crap all day long. Um, I would yeah. have fruit for breakfast. I love fruit. It's so sweet. I would have chocolates. I would have croissants. I would have ice cream. Again, it would have to be, it has no impact. So it wouldn't make you feel rubbish. It wouldn't make you fat. It wouldn't give you diabetes. It had no impact whatsoever. I would be quite happy eating crap all day long. Um, I, I know I feel better now eating real food because I know that food has a massive impact on how you feel physically, mentally, emotionally, energy-wise and all the rest of it. Um, but if, if someone gave me an honest choice and said it has no impact on anything, do you want a mushroom risotto or do you want a steak? I would actually choose the mushroom risotto and that might surprise people. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm definitely, uh, I was born in Brazil, grew up eating a lot of okay. meat. And so, uh, <laughs> I'd probably be name. just a carnivore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if, and my if it was more well, affordable. He's... Oh yeah. 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 And he, he, my hubby's definitely a carnivore. I mean, if he's just naturally keto, you know, he gets up, he has bacon and eggs for lunch. Yeah. He'll have, fish or eggs, dinner, steak, and then it's kind of, there's some green things on the slide, but you kind of get the impression that, it's only because he grew them in the garden. If he hadn't right. done that, he'd be like, yeah, who needs those? You know, I, I, I got meat and then I got cheese for pudding. You know, what else do I need? Um, I'm very no, much I'm, the I'm, same. I'm definitely, I, yeah. Hey, we're all different, but what we need is the same. We're different in what yeah. we like, but what we need, we're the same. Um, when, uh, there's so kind of, the way I try to structure the interview is kind of dealing with all the meat topics. And I think we covered quite a bit. Um, one that I, we didn't really get to is maybe if you could briefly, even like just a minute bird's eye view, I know it can be challenging. Um, is the, the thought, your thoughts on like processed meat versus unprocessed. It seems like the research is a little mixed. Like we should avoid unprocessed meat because it can increase risks of certain cancers. But then when you, then there's other research that says actually the risk is really small and it doesn't really change too much. Like, have you had time to, to dive into kind of like the real meat versus processed meat? 
Yeah, and I think it again comes back to what is natural. So I'm from Europe, and if you look at processed meat in Europe, so if you go into a delicatessen in France or the Mediterranean, particularly um, France, Spain, Italy, Greece, going into a delicatessen, Italy particularly, well, fatty France too, the meat counter is meters long. And they've got salamis mm -hmm. and they've got dry cured this, that and the other. Um, where they've basically preserved meat, because remember, we would catch the animal and we couldn't eat it all on, you know, we did in the beginning. We had no means of preserving meat. Um, but as soon as we learned how to preserve meat, either by salting it or hanging it, hanging it out to dry, we were then able to sort of pace out the, the killing. Um, so our, our foraging it just became a lot more useful to us. It could sustain us over, over a much longer period of time. So to me, that is completely and utterly natural and completely and utterly healthy. Where processed meat starts going wrong, and I've actually heard Anthony say this as well, actually, I thought this was really amusing. He's worked it out too. The meat is not the issue because we know that there's no evidence whatsoever against red meat. So if you then just dry it or salt it, there's no issue with salt either. You've still stayed mm -hmm. within that. We know there's nothing wrong with it. When you start adding other stuff to it, but then it's the other stuff. So yeah. you will quite often find sugars in processed meat. You'll find maltodextrin, you'll find wheat, you'll find rusk, you'll find fillers, um, other preservatives that might then make it not so healthy. Um, I still don't think it's, it, it's a problem. I mean, again, I've looked at the complete evidence on the USDA website when the International Association for Research into Cancer published their famous report. Those are the kind of reports that I do go after. Um, and I remember at the time going through it and it's like, is it this cancer? No, is it that cancer? No, is it that cancer? You come down to, oh, there might be an association with bowel cancer. Um, and there's a particular, I'll, I'll try and find it for you if you do the show notes, there's a particular post when I dissected it and dissected it and dissected it, you know, what are you talking about here? They'll say, oh, there's a 25% risk difference. And of course, a 25% risk difference might still be the difference between one in 10,000 and 1.25 in 10,000. So who cares? Um, but it's also, I think it was on, you had to eat, it was like four grams difference over um, a period of time. It, it was absolutely minute, the difference. You have to yeah. that it would make to health anyway and yet they go and trumpet these big headlines from the from the rooftops or whatever it's like guys it's just not an issue when you actually get down to the absolute risk and how much you would have to eat to generate that absolute risk it's like guys there is serious you're way more risky getting in a car or crossing the road or um I don't know, getting, no, not getting on yeah. an aeroplane, that's pretty safe. Actually, driving a car, <laughs> yeah. driving a car is the riskiest thing we ever do. Um, it's true. If, if you're driving a car without due attention and you're worried about processed meat, you've not done your risk analysis the right way around. Yeah. Um, moving on to more focusing on plants, and you have like one lecture just on, I think, fiber. Uh, and yet you've broken it down in some some blogs as well, or some of your articles there. Uh, and I had a conversation, so I did my general surgery rotation in September. And talking to general surgeons, uh, they're really big on fiber because they see a lot of bowel GI issues and find a lot of importance in it. And I'm trying to understand uh, the importance of it. So kind of overview i'm going to try and guess what your kind of take on it is and then you can clarify okay it seems like fiber doesn't have a nutritional value but it may be beneficial in certain gi uh, uh, diseases primarily soluble fiber and other things like uh, prevention of hemorrhoids and things, which is not a nice disease, but it's something that's so common in general surgery. So it's what came to mind. Um, does that seem kind of accurate? 
Um, you should have stopped at it's got no nutrients in it, and then you would be one hundred percent accurate. So, um, a, a quick lesson on carbohydrates. See if I can remember it from a presentation I gave three years ago. Um, so, carbohydrates one hundred and one. You've got your monosaccharides. Mono meaning one, saccharide meaning sugar. So, all carbohydrates are essentially sugar. So, your monosaccharides are glucose, fructose, and galactose. Um, your single sugars. Then you've got your disaccharides. So let's just take one that people are familiar with. So sucrose is a disaccharide and sucrose is one molecule of glucose and one molecule of fructose. So those single sugars get sort of formed together. So I think lactose disaccharide is one molecule of galactose and one molecule of glucose. Um, you then come up to many sugars, polysaccharides, and you have digestible polysaccharides and you have indigestible polysaccharides. Fiber is an indigestible polysaccharide. So it is many sugars that we can't digest. Now does that sound good to you? There you go, brilliant. So yeah, lactose, I got that right. So lactose is glucose, galactose, maltose, we don't hear about maltose very much, um, two molecules of glucose. And then the next slide, the next um, thing in that presentation would have um, the polysaccharides, there you go. So you've got the digestible ones and the digestible form of many sugars in humans is how we store carbohydrate. We touched on this earlier, that's glycogen. And the plant mm -hmm. storage form of many sugars is starch. Now, if you then move to the next slide, you've then got the indigestible polysaccharides. And the indigestible polysaccharides are either soluble and soluble are things that you can see would swell in water. So, for example, if you took um, what swells in water, porridge oats. So you could take porridge oats and you pour water on them and then they swell. So that's soluble many sugars, soluble fiber. Insoluble fiber, um, if you put, for example, um, kidney beans in a bowl of water and didn't heat them in any way, nothing happens to them. They just stay as hard right. kidney beans. They don't, they don't sort of swell or do anything at all. So fiber is basically a waste product. The body cannot digest it. So my first question is then, in every other field of life, a waste product is not a good thing. Waste is, is bad, yeah? Waste is rubbish, waste is discard, waste is get rid of. How come mm -hmm. in the human body suddenly waste is this magical thing that we should all be eating 30 grams of a day? How, how does that add up? Um, if you look at the whole yeah. of that presentation, you'll realize that a lot of this came from John Harvey Kellogg, Sylvester Graham. So the original cereal manufacturers back in the late 1800s. And of course, those guys were setting up massive um, cereal companies. So it's in there, Syl Sylvester Graham, there you go, John Harvey Kellogg. Um, 1852, 1943. They wanted people to consume their cereal based products. So they were the ones that started this whole fiber is good. And the reason they said fiber is good, um, they were both uh, pretty religious guys. And they said that um, basically fiber would stop men masturbating. Um, so it would stop sexual urges in men. Um, and that's why they said that fiber was a good thing. So, you know, you've probably got some mm. Um, young male followers at the moment who now should be ditching the fibre because if it's going to affect your libido, if they were right, and I don't know if they were right, then yeah. who needs the fibre? But it's a waste product that the body can't digest it. So how is it good for us? How is it, how is it doing anything other than abrasing the digestive tract as it goes down? Now, I would put it to those gastroenterologists Maybe the fact that you're seeing so many people with bowel disease and bowel cancer and hemorrhoids and all the rest of it is because people are trying to eat this 30 grams of stuff that they can't even digest. And then the body has got to get rid of it every day. So there's a great study, um, and I don't know if it's in that presentation. I only had half an hour in that one at Low Carb Denver. I did another version in London that year, um, and I did get onto this study at the end. And there's a great study that was done over in the Far East um, I'll sh okay. It would be at about, um, it would be after sort of 20 minutes if I did get to it, but I think it's in the London one. 
And of course, yeah, there's mm. no RCT yeah. evidence whatsoever that fibre is good for us. There was a study done over in the Far East where they took, I think it was 67 people with the most horrific bowel disease. So these poor people had the, the worst bowel symptoms that you can think of, diarrhea, constipation, bloating, abdominal pain, um, pain to the point that n we're not talking discomfort, we're talking debilitating pain, can't go to work kind yeah. of pain. And the study was, <coughs> we're going to take you off all fiber. And we've done the questionnaire, so we know the level of your symptoms. And we're going to take you off all fiber, and then we're going to ask you to rate your symptoms again. And every single issue disappeared. Every single wow. gastrointestinal issue disappeared. So then the study was basically to then say to the participants, do you want to go back to fiber? And of course, most didn't. And I would suggest hmm. that those that did would be those that like food that contains fiber. So that would be people who like fruit or people yeah. who uh, they, they were just in a routine with their lifestyle and they would find it too difficult to change out of that. But I bet they would have gone back to the fiber, had the problem and then finally come off it. So I was at Cambridge with a guy who went on to become one of the top gastroenterologists in the UK. And I met up with him at a, a reunion a few years ago. And I was just getting into all of this stuff. So I said, oh, go on, tell me, what do you do? Um, what's, where's your position on fiber? And he said, the minute someone walks through the door, I take them off fiber. And I went, yes, thank you. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he got it. Okay. He got it. Cambridge graduate and he got it. He'd seen too many people coming in. And he'd send them off to a dietitian in the early days. And the dietitian would say, oh, you need more fiber. It's like, actually, no, you need yeah. zero fiber. You need to go on a pretty much a carnivore diet. Yeah. And if you Interesting. Have, yeah. If, if you have carbs, have non-fibrous carbs. So what my friend would say is if, if you know, let's say he's talking to a patient, um, an Asian patient um, for whom rice is really important in the diet and they've come over from Asia and they've met British dietitians who are telling them to have brown rice because it's got more fiber. My friend yeah. was saying, no, white rice, go for your risotto rice, go for your um, no whole grain rice, white rice, no fiber. Ditto, if you're going to have pasta, pasta isn't great for the bowel anyway, wheat isn't great, no no whole wheat pasta, white, if you're having bread, white bread, take the fiber out of your diet. I appreciate that. Um, and I find myself caught in the middle, obviously, like, I uh, love listening to this, hearing this kind of information, one, because I, I just don't like fiber, but two, <laughs> um, uh, but like the, the reason I'm caught is because I agree with this. Um, I think it, it plays out in the real world when people actually apply it. But as a, a upcoming family doctor too, I have to uphold the standard of care or at least give the patient the option. And so my goal is to become educated on both sides of the of the coin and to be able to present to the patient like, hey, listen, like if you've tried, you've, you've seen the dietitian, maybe it's not working, it's a couple months in or a year in, uh, how about we try this different approach? And at least I'll have that knowledge to guide them through that approach. And so I think at this stage of my training, that's the least of what I can do is just provide two sides and give that patient that, that choice, which is always what a, a doctor should do. And so even on the stat in front for cholesterol, I, I want to start kind of creating a spiel where I incorporate the science, the relative risk reduction, the absolute risk reduction, and being like, hey, you know, you can make your choice. I'll support you either way. And we can look at dietary approaches as well. Um, be, uh, and so the reason why I brought this up, aside from you having a lot of experience, like knowledge about this and having a lecture is because I had a whole, like a, a long conversation with the general surgeon and she was very much like brown rice, pro fiber, low meat, low fat. And I'm like, no, I mean, she's really nice. We had a great conversation. Um, but I was like, ah, okay, this is, I have to talk to Zoe about this. Um, I think, <laughs> so, okay, I think here, what... here's a really fun thing to do. When, when you meet people like that, this is really fun. Ask them questions. It's not for you to defend your position. They're the ones giving out the dietary guidelines. It's for them to defend their position. So um, Gary Fetke, one of his, Dr. Very, Gary <laughs> Fetke in, in Australia, one of his favorite questions when he, he's putting his patients on low carb diets because he doesn't want to amputate their limbs. And when he gets yeah. fellow surgeons saying, oh, aren't you worried about cholesterol? He says to them, what's cholesterol? And they can't answer the question. So the next person who says to me, oh, you know, you should be eating loads of fiber, say, what's fiber? 
you know, see if, if your colleague right. can explain it as monosaccharides, disaccharides, polysaccharides, digestible, polysaccharides, indigestible, but what we just went through, soluble, insoluble, yeah. and essentially come to the conclusion that it's uh, multiple sugar that we can't digest. And then when they say those words coming out of their mouth, they start thinking, hmm, yeah, many sugars that you can't digest. You have to get people to start questioning their own paradigm system. So when Gary Fecky says, what's cholesterol? Most of his colleagues can't answer it. So yeah, he'd say, true. well, you know, if you had some in your hand, what would it look like? Um, the answer is it would look like a vanilla candle had melted in your hand. It's a sort of pale color and it would look quite waxy. Um, it's the stuff of life. But if you can't, mm -hmm. this stuff, as you say, you just get taught it at med school. It, it becomes so much part of the narrative. Um, I, I see people present in the field that I'm at and they're talking, and I know they've worked out a lot of this stuff. And I see them talking about large, fluffy LDL and small, dense LDL and all the rest of it. And I'm just sat there and I don't know whether to laugh or cry. It's like, guys, you've worked this out. What do you... Like, the implication is that the small, dense LDL can penetrate the arterial wall and the large, fluffy stuff can't. Seriously? You honestly think that the endothelial wall allows anything to penetrate it? We'd be toast if it did that. Why would we yeah. need LDL receptors if LDL could just be trundling along in the bloodstream and then like, oh, I'll just slip in through that little gap in the arterial wall there. Why? Why would it do that? Oh, because I want to kill the person. I'll just start furring up the artery. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. <laughs> so we talked about the the fiber. We've talked a lot, a lot and I just want to cover a couple more questions so I don't uh, hold you oh, here well, too long. Well, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's dark. We've got to cover all already. of them. <laughs> we started off in the um, daylight and now it's dark. Yeah. Uh, the other question that another topic that people really care about nowadays is seed oils. You know, they've become part of the modern diet. It's in everything that we eat pretty much, uh, at least the, the processed, foods. processed foods. What concerns yeah. do you have about uh, their impact on health and, and why? I know I've seen some video. There's some doctors, PhD doctors that will kind of do a, a review of the papers and say, you know what, you know, pro uh, vegetable oils actually show cardiac um, benefit and they're not all that bad. I'm not sure if there's a difference if it's like fried versus just cold oils. What do you have to say for that? So there are, again, I don't do something if someone else has already done it. I don't need to. Um, okay. I, I think some forerunners in this field, Nina Teicholz in Big Fat Surprise, did some great stuff on vegetable oils. David Gillespie written a book called Toxic Oil. And someone I've seen more recently is Chris um, Noby, I think, K-N-O-B-B-E. -B -E. Saw mm, him present yeah. at a conference in May. He's just, he's at low carb in Australia at the moment. Um, he presents the case that basically pretty much all the ills that have befallen humankind over the last few decades or whatever are all down to vegetable oils. And I, I don't think there's a single answer for all of this. I think it's a lot of things that have come together. Um, people are not eating vegetable oils on their own. They're eating vegetable oils, as you said, in, in processed food. Um, so for me, the, the, the problem is processed food. Um, they're not a natural food. So if you go back to that eat real food, extracting oil from seeds is not actually a natural thing to do. I, I would argue that's a, a food, well it is, it's a food process. And you've ended mm -hmm. up, therefore, with a processed food, which is not a great thing. So sunflower seeds are very good, particularly for vitamin E, really good for vitamin E. I mean, role, leading, you know, best food for vitamin E whatsoever. Um, but not sunflower oil. Don't, why right. would you want sunflower oil kind of thing? Um, so I was gonna, if you're going to cook, then cook food in its natural fat. So meat you can cook in its own fat, and then it provides some fat which you can use for cooking things that don't provide their own natural fat. Um, if you're going to cook vegetables, some people don't mind them in butter. Some people find that's too overpowering a taste. I, I'm, I'm in that group. That's kind of bubble and squeak to me. That's too overpowering. So then um, stir fry in olive oil or, or something like that. But you should not be using 
the poly, the heavily polyunsaturated fat oils, which is the sunflower oil, rapeseed oil, um, canola oil, and all that kind of thing. Um, no, not in cooking, not adding to food in any way, not as salad dressing, and definitely you should be avoiding processed foods anyway. So if you eat processed food, you're going to consume a lot of these cheap, overheated, potentially carcinogenic vegetable oils, but then you shouldn't be eating processed food in the first place. It's not just that yeah. part of the processed food that's going to harm you. Yeah, what I usually tell my patients is um, if you can kill the animal or pull the vegetable or fruit from the from the ground or the trees, eat it. But if you can't do any of that, if you can't go hunting for it, then don't eat it. I think that kind of keeps it nice and simple. Um, and I agree with that. I wanted to pull up. I'm going to share with you. I don't know how I came across this. I was preparing for this yesterday, and um, apparently the World Health Organization updated their guidelines on defining healthy diets. And just wanted to oh, share with you. Maybe you'll you'll be frustrated. Um, <laughs> carbohydrate intake should com com comprise 40 to 70 percent of total calorie intake. And then they talk about saturated fat intake should be reduced to 10% or less, which I think has been pretty similar to what they recommended before. Mm -hmm. And uh, fat intake should comprise 30 or less. And then if you look at the healthy plate, you see vegetables, fruits, whole grains, so carbs, 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 uh, yeah. with uh, fiber. And uh, healthy protein, which they'd probably say, you know, nuts, seeds, legumes, all that yeah, primarily. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> the other thing I wanted to share with you, let me see if I can, I actually got this um, message from my supervisor today in our kind of resident chat group that they recently updated uh, a simplified lipid guideline, which, you know, maybe I'll send to you to, to break down on your, <laughs> if you, for Mondays. Let me see if I can, there. Uh, is that? Can you see that at all? It, it's really. I'm. I'm on my husband's massive Mac screen or whatever. Oh, is this your yeah, sort of so, when you should be taking statins or something? Ten percent. Yeah. So they talk about statins and it's it's long. I won't. Maybe I can send it to you if you want to look at it. But what frustrated me was that they still include a relative risk reduction when recommending the statins, right? And I know from. Uh, your breakdowns and other doctors' breakdowns of of this is that, um, and I hear hear me out. Anybody listening or any supervisors listening to this podcast, because I know they do listen, um, always consult your doctor. You know before you know discontinue a medication and starting one. But I think it's important for everybody to know the difference between the like absolute risk reduction and then the relative risk reduction. And here they just quote the one and it could be a change of like 0.1 percent absolute risk reduction so i just wanted to share that with you maybe a little bit yes, of frustration my favorite website on that one is um something called the nnt.com the number needed to treat.com and it's an independent oh, okay. group and if you go on there and for example if you put in statins um for someone who's not had previous heart disease and it's an independent group that have gone through the literature and they put it, because the number needed to treat is giving it to you in, 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 in absolute risk terms, which is how you need to take it in. So what it will say is if you haven't had heart disease before, and I'm picking these numbers from memory, so don't hold me to them, but they're, they're, not, they're not gonna be far off. Um, not had heart disease before, take a statin for five years, no lives will be saved, you know, no lives are going to be saved anyway, we're all going to die, but no lives will be saved in that period. Um, I think it's something like you might have a 1 in 154 likelihood of avoiding an event, and an event mm -hmm. can be angina, um, it's, it's certainly nothing fatal anyway. But then they also look at the number needed to harm being on a statin for five years. And they, I think it's one in 50 likelihood of developing type two diabetes. And a mm. one in, I better get this one right. I think it's a one in 10, might be a one in 20, but it's it's high. Um, I think it's one in 10 of muscle damage. Um, because of course, as we were saying with the mevalonate pathway, that's going to your mind, memory, muscles, mojo, da da da. da. Um, and it will have an impact on that. now. 
If patients are presented with that website, I've got cardiologist friends who've done this and said, okay, if you take a statin for the next five years, and a lot of people don't like taking meds, certainly not on a daily basis anyway, these, these are your likelihoods. They shrug their shoulders and they say, oh, I don't think I'll bother. I don't really fancy type 2 diabetes and I certainly don't fancy muscle damage. Quite like the idea of not having that one event. Um, but they weigh it up and actually say, Do you know, what? I, I, I don't think I'll bother. And that's the way to present information to people. So on, on that bowel cancer thing that we were talking about earlier, I think the numbers really were something yeah. like you've got a one in 10,000 risk. And if you had, you know, half a pack of bacon every day, you've got a 1.0 something in 10,000 risk. So it's like you've got a one in 14 million chance of winning the lottery. If you buy another ticket, you've got two chances in 14 million. You've still got 13,999,000 chances yeah. of not winning the lottery. You are you are still not going to win the lottery, or you're no more likely to win the lottery than you were with one ticket and fourteen million. But somebody, the the relative risk would be you've just doubled your chance of winning the lottery. Now most yeah. people double the chance of winning the lottery. I'll take that, but you've you've still got a one in fourteen million chance of of doing it. Now back to that other slide that you presented on the diet. That was why I did my PhD. So those are the dietary guidelines have no more than 30% of your diet in the form of fat. Okay, just a, a, a real quick thing here. Imagine a sort of a, a circle. Remember, there's only three things that we eat, three macronutrients, three things with calories, carbohydrate, fat, and protein. Remember that protein is in virtually everything. The fact that protein is in virtually everything means that the global intake of protein is remarkably constant. So even mm. though you're carnivore, and even though I'm not, I would wager that our protein intake is probably around 15 to 20% of our diet. And in most people, it's around 15%. So when they set that guideline that said you should have no more than 30% of your diet in the form of total fat, can you see what they automatically did to carbohydrate? You've got 15% protein, 30% fat, 55% has to be carbohydrate. They didn't test yep. that. They didn't do an RCT on that. They don't even know that that's safe let alone do they know that it's healthy. It's just the inevitable consequence of having set a restriction on fat. So my PhD, which is also on my website, my PhD basically said, right, why did they set those dietary fat guidelines? 30% total fat, 10% saturated fat. Why did they set those? And they set those in the name of heart disease. So that was my PhD. So the PhD said, right, I'm gonna go back to when they set the dietary guidelines, which was 1977, 1980 in the US, 1983 in the UK, and I'm going to pretend I'm the committee at the time, and I'm going to look at all the RCT evidence, and I'm going to look at all the epidemiological evidence, and I'm going to see, would it have told me to introduce those two guidelines? Spoiler alert, zero evidence. I did not expect that. Um, I mean, you don't go into your PhD with a preconceived idea. If you do, you're not doing research. You're you're, yeah. you're wasting your time. Um, but if someone had stopped me and said, what do you think you'll find? Yeah, that, that's the great pie chart slide. <laughs> what do you think you'll find? I would have said, I think I'll find evidence for those dietary guidelines being introduced, but maybe they didn't factor in the harm that they would do. Maybe they didn't realize all that carbohydrate was gonna fuel obesity and diabetes. As it turned out, there was no evidence for why they introduced those dietary fat guidelines in the first place. Not RCT, not epidemiological. So the second part of my PhD was, okay, that was then. I'm doing my PhD in 2015. Let's bring it up to date. Let's look at all the evidence that's available now, all the RCT evidence, all the epidemiological evidence when they either tried to reduce fat or swapped out saturated fat, swapped in more unsaturated fat no evidence whatsoever there is just hmm. no evidence for this and the consequences i think have been catastrophic because i do think that inevitable carbohydrate increase and then that quote there increased carbohydrate consumption to account for 55 to 60 percent of calorie intake that was kind of if you haven't worked out the consequence of that 30 percent fat we're going to spell it out for you you've got to be having that kind of proportion of your diet or that thing you showed me earlier 40 to 70 percent of your diet in the form of the one macronutrient that we don't even need. Yeah. We need fat, I think, we need protein. Uh, one quote, which I think you quoted somebody else um, in one of your lectures was, 
humans are the only species smart enough to create their own food <laughs> and stupid enough to eat <laughs> to it. Eat and it. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's usually my final slide actually which is it's been yeah. stupid 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 all the way through the presentation it's like and then there's the stupid thought at the end and most people then get that and they're like yeah we do make our own food don't we and we don't do a very good job of it you know nature has done a way better job you know uh, red meat yeah they remember it cheerios you know i think the farmer won so um as we wrap up, you know, we've been here for an hour and a half, which I really appreciate your time. One question that I like to ask every guest on the show um, is what are three traits of someone who is unstoppable? Um, so I, I go back to my HR days for this, actually, because when I was HR director, um, Mars, the candy company, um, is actually one of the best companies in the world to work for. I can't say a bad word about Mars. I now don't think the products are great. They make fake food for pets and they make fake food for humans. I don't think the products are great, but the company is just great. Um, we actually had four, if I'm allowed four, but there were yeah. universally, there were four criteria at Mars that you would recruit and you would recruit a CEO to have these criteria and you would recruit a receptionist or somebody working on the production line to have these criteria. They might need them in different ways and in, in different amounts, but these were the important criteria. So number one was what we called at Mars achievement motivation, which is the drive to achieve something. Um, if you don't have the drive to achieve something, you might as well not be here. Um, it doesn't matter what that motivation, you might want to be a, a painter, or whatever, it doesn't matter, but you've, you've got to have a drive to achieve something, otherwise you're really not maximizing your, your time on this earth. Second one then was critical thinking. You've got to be able to evaluate things around you, evaluate um, new information that comes in, evaluate crises, evaluate what's good, what's not so good, what's safe, what's not so safe. Um, again, different level for different people in the organization, but you've got to be able to critically evaluate, and that means doing it on your own, not doing what you're told. Um, mm. If 900 people in the factory are doing one thing, and you're the one who probably critically evaluates something, you might come up with a new process that saves Mars, um, you know, 100 million pounds over the next year. They, they wanted that challenge, that critical thinking. Um, third one was then judgment. If you don't have good judgment, if you can't weigh up that situation, if you can't see the consequences of your critical thinking, um, what might happen, if you can't be fair and decent and just to people around you if you're not a good judge good judge of character good judge of situation good judge of priorities mars is not interested and then the final one for mars was um influencing skills which was there um i mean people's skills were kind of a given at mars but influencing skills if you've got all of those so you've got the drive to do something you're the great thinker that's going to come up with this brilliant idea you've weighed everything up and you realize it really is truly brilliant and you can't then take anyone with you there was no point having that brilliant idea so you've then got to be able to influence right. other people um to take them with you um, and you know, if there's any anyone in HR who's now watching this, they'll now evaluate me throughout this last hour and a half against those criteria because I wouldn't have worked for Mars if, at the level I was working at Mars, I didn't have some of those. So I, I am aware that, for example, on influencing, um, you know, I've had, and you'll have this as well because you're passionate about your diet. You'll have friends that say to you, "Well, you're really." you know you're 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 really quite um yeah you're persuasive that's a good thing but whoa you know almost you're a little bit heavy on this because i'm still eating my plants i'm still vegetarian i'm kind of not with you yet but they do at least say i understand what you're saying and actually in yeah. this respect I'm not, I'm not trying to change anyone you know i'll tell you a little really quick anecdote when i was doing all the hr stuff and i ended up on the board of the national health service in wales and i ended up on the board of a university and i've been to loads of these black tie dinners and of course you sat down at the dinner and you've got two complete strangers on either side so the first thing you say to each other is what do you do who are you um hello you know introduce yourself or whatever um and then when i wasn't doing the hr let, let's say i didn't want to do hr that evening and i'd be like okay i you know I, I write books or something just to have a different kind of conversation and or you say you're interested in diet and health almost all the time they would say oh you'll be watching what i eat and my reply oh. used to be, I don't care what you eat. I care that you know what you should eat. 
And mm. that's, that's why I do what I do, and that's why Nina Teicholz does what she does. She is actually trying to change the dietary guidelines. I'm not. I'm trying to just say to anyone who wants to listen, anyone who wants to take care of their own health, I'm going to give you a different perspective and you're going to get 99% of the message on narrative. You're going to be told, eat low fat, avoid meat, it's bad for the environment, bad for you, fur up your arteries, cholesterol is bad, take your statins, fibre is great, saturated fat will kill you. you you're going to get that from 99% of the world. So I'm just a little voice in the other ear that happens to have looked at this. I like to think pretty objectively because I've got no skin in the game. I make no, I don't make any money out of, you know, I could have made way more money selling a book that said, count your calories. I actually wrote a book that says, don't count calories. You need right. to start eating food and not worrying about calories. So um, just, I just want people to know that the narrative isn't, it, it's not making sense. And I don't think it's making people healthy. So challenge it, think about it, critically think and sort it out for yourself. I appreciate you sharing that very important four points and um, also that kind of life experience there and just appreciate your, your passion and willingness to share your knowledge. With that being said, if anybody listening to this podcast would like to kind of get in contact with you or just get more of your, your books, your, your articles, how can they learn more about you? Yeah, so um, I've got a website, which is just my name, which is on the screen there. ZoeHarkham.com is the website. There's quite a lot on open view. I mean, my my business model um, to be able to put red meat on the table is the Monday note, um, and it's not even a pound a week, and you get the dissections. But I do put a, a good number, and certainly some of the older ones, some of those red meat dissections would definitely be on open view. I'm on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, I have been quite animated on Twitter at various times and then I become less animated on Twitter at other times um, kind of a little bit now really because when the world kind of goes into a bad place I kind of um, I don't know with stuff that's going on and we we know when we're recording this and we know the stuff that's going on at the moment and you just think yeah sort of putting a tweet out about fiber just sort of just seems a bit irrelevant really when people are mm -hmm. are dying and i mean we've always got war in the world and i just hate war above everything um but i'll i'll, I'll be back don't we you know in, in a few days it'll be like no 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 saturated fat is important and and nutrition yeah. is important and staying healthy is important and trying to give positive messages as well hopefully i do a few of those and um yeah whatever so it's, it's my website or it's twitter those are the main ones Great. <laughs> Great. And I'll put those in the show notes. And I really appreciate the, the conversation that we had today and all the knowledge you shared. I'd love to have you on in the future sometime to continue talking about other topics. One that we didn't get around to is uh, salt, just kind of dive deeper in that. And also just hormonal health. I think it's something so big that we as MDs just don't know. Like we know kind of like, you know, uh, side effects of hormonal treatment. <laughs> and then that's that's kind of it. Um, instead of the nuances and how diet can influence hormonal health. So maybe in the future we can delve into that. But thank you very much. Um, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you very much as well, actually. I mean, people should realize we don't know each other. I mean, you just reached nope. out to me, you emailed me, I emailed back. You said, yeah, thank you for the indite. Let's do this. And then we get a date yeah. and we work out the time difference. And it's, it's been like we've been out having a coffee and, okay, I've done most of the talking because you're the host and I'm the guest or whatever. But... It always amazes me how in the field, kind of, we're, we're tribe members, aren't we? We're, we're tribe members who've realized that, that um, the food advice is wrong. And when you meet another tribe member, um, whatever your tribe is, um, you do, you just, you just connect with them immediately. And I think that's a, a lovely thing about finding your tribe and, and then being part of it. So I just wanted to make that observation as well. Yeah, I agree. And I'm so appreciative of the uh, the mentors in the tribe, being like such as yourself, being willing to take some time and share some more knowledge to those who just don't know but are thirsty to learn some more. That's very nice. Thank you.